Welcome to the Ancient Warfare Magazine podcast. I'm Angus Wallace of the History Network. In this episode, we'll be looking at Volume 8, Issue 1, Deserters, Defectors and Traitors, Betrayal in the Ancient World. This was a thought-provoking issue covering some thousand years, from the biblical David's insurgency against Saul to the Catalan conspiracy to overthrow the Roman Republic. Joining me is Ancient Warfare regulars Joshua Browers, Murray Dam, Lindsay Powell and Mark McCaffrey. I think an obvious starting point is how do we define a traitor? Um, Mark posed the question whilst we were preparing for the podcast. Um, is it a person's actions or how they were subsequently depicted by uh, those that recorded history? I sort of tried to answer that in the introduction to the issue when I said that, that most of the time because out of, uh, out of fear or for personal gain or uh, something, uh, like that and I think in the end whether somebody is really labeled a traitor depends on how history judges them. Mm. I was going to throw in here according to my dictionary definition it literally comes from the Latin tradere which means to hand over. Mm -hmm. uh, traditor is, 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 the, is the noun that comes from that so there's, there's clearly an idea there that somebody is handing over I guess either themselves or information or something along those lines uh, that they shouldn't be. I think hindsight obviously is very important for defining a traitor, especially if um, the traitor in question uh, gets to write their own version of history and justify what they did, or if someone else writes the history and then uh, explains the actions of a traitor, like Alcibiades for instance, as, as, as betrayal, um, or whether Caesar says, well these are the reasons I did what I did, and I'm not a traitor, I'm, you know, I'm doing it because I, my, my hand was forced. So I think it's, it's, all, it's all those things, but um, certainly um, history's condemnation or, or otherwise, um, propaganda, uh, you know, there have been traitors who, who might not necessarily have been tra traitors at the time, but then with the uh, example of Octavian and, and Antony, for instance, where someone isn't portrayed as a traitor during the Civil War, it's the fact that he's allying with a foreign queen, um, so that the attack is not made on Antony, the attack is made on Cleopatra and the fact that Antony sides with her is the bad thing. And then after they've gotten rid of them, then they become Danatio Memoriae. And, you know, so there is hindsight, there is propaganda, there's timing. All of those things sort of come into when is a traitor a traitor. And what we do, of course, today is we reassess uh, lots of these figures and we say, well, actually, I think we've got that wrong. They, they're probably not as bad as they were portrayed at the time. I think Caesar's the ultimate one who actually gets away with not being labelled a traitor, really, because if we had other sources available to us that aren't you know, so much either held down by him, like, I mean, for example, Cicero barely really gets a word in as to what he really thinks about Caesar a lot of the time because there is a little bit of a background relationship going on between the two of them there, and he doesn't really let fly on him as much as he might you know, otherwise. And then later on, all the other sources that come along later are looking at it with hindsight, thinking, oh, we've got to please the, uh, whoever later on, be it Augustus, be it Tiberius, be it much further in the future, that are saying we're, we're looking back at that golden age when uh, Caesar did all those great things and we're not going to list, label him a traitor because that's our heritage. And as the progenitor of the, of the empire, there's that sort of like, well, we can't be we can't be based on a betrayal or else there'll be hmm. fundamental undermining of, of, of our system. I mean, it's very much history being written by the victors, of course. Mm. And in this particular case, the, the, the best source we have for Caesar is uh, Caesar. Hmm. So, and it's the same with Cicero as well. Cicero is the best source yeah. for Cicero. Cicero being the, the one who writes most about himself, that we're reliant on him as the main source. And no matter what, in terms of the Catalan conspiracy, we get little, very little in terms of other sources giving us major details that don't come from Cicero directly or even indirectly. Uh, we get little in terms of what the disturbances were around Italy caused by Catiline or his associates. It's mostly hearsay from Cicero's speeches or Cicero winding it up. So really, ultimately, we do, was it actually a big thing, the Catiline conspiracy, or was it just something that was blown out of all proportion by Cicero, wanting his consulship to be magnificent, for him to be announced pater patrius 
of Rome. We have to make those value judgments all the way. Uh, you know, my, my particular specialty is the period of Augustus, and it's interesting to me um, how maybe part of his regime was to filter some of these very same stories to ensure that certain versions come down to us and other ones don't. Uh, so, of course, we don't know that, um, but, but it does seem to me strange that we only seem to get certain versions of history, like the Livies, for example, and maybe Asinius Pollio might have been, but doesn't seem to have survived. Um, Cicero was, was, was a very good orator, and I think for that reason probably was, was allowed to survive. But considering also most of what is produced by him, we're led to believe, is actually him even, you know, it's not purely what he produced in terms of his speeches or his essays. They are all taken back and edited by him and his uh, you know, very famous little secretary, Tyro, uh, later on, making sure that they, t you know, they spout the, the line that he wishes to go out to his public. In some cases, it doesn't happen. Like the Marius, you know, Marius is is portrayed as a uh, a traitor to Rome by Sulla, and then in turn Sulla, and then Cicero, um, both coming from Arpinum, try and tries to redress that balance. But it's almost um, so obvious that Cicero's material on on Marius is so biased mm -hmm. that it, it it sort of negates itself. Within the Roman Republic, there's a, there's a, an important tool which is this, uh, the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, which which basically means that you follow this or you are a traitor. You cross the Rubico River or you, and you become a traitor. Um, you know that the, they have very explicit rules about these sorts of things, um, and it happened several times. I mean, I, I'm quite surprised how many times. For example, Marcus Antonius you spoke about earlier. I mean, he received one at uh, the, the sort of Mutina. And just laughed effectively and say, you know, come, you know, like the the American revolutionaries, you know, come, come and fetch me type thing. Uh, so um, it sort of guts your response to uh, was a legalistic rule. I think the uh, Sonatus Consultum though can actually be a how can I say double-edged knife really in terms of it can actually lead to you being labelled a traitor because it's I mean like Cicero has given it to, to sort out the Catalan conspiracy, but it's, I mean, when it comes down to it, what Sonatus Consultant is, is go and do what you must to preserve the Republic, but it doesn't have any legal binding to it, and so therefore you're basically going on the Senate's word, and if they turn around and say later on, actually, we, in hindsight, it wasn't such a great idea to put all those guys to, uh, to death, then, you know, five, five years down the line, Cicero's run for his life. So it's uh, whether he's being labelled a traitor by one person or by the Senate, in the case of him being labelled by Clodius, uh, I mean, one person can push him out of Rome as a traitor later on by on the basis of that Sinatra's consultant. I think that actually happens in the year 43, uh, 44, when in fact uh, the Senate pretty much rallies around the conspirators mm. um, and you've got Decimus Brutus up in Mutina and then Marcus Antonius goes up to, to, to deal with that situation. And then there's a regime change. that the, the, After the battle, the consuls change, and then they basically reverse course. Uh, so you're quite right. I think it does come down to whoever is uh, in charge at the time that r r writes the rules. In which case, uh, people could flip-flop between traitor and non-traitor? Just like today. I mean, whoever is in charge, um, you know, it's one particular uh, political regime. And a new one comes in, and of course, whoever was in the previous one, they can all be written off. I mean, it, it really depends. One of the problems with the Roman um, idea of traitor is Rome itself. That when we look at battles like Cannae and consuls who do the Roman thing, they are in fact betraying the state because they're getting thousands and thousands of Romans killed. Whereas Fabius the Delayer is is a, is a traitor because he's not fighting battles the Roman way. He's doing this. Un dishonourable thing, which ends up saving Rome. So, and again, that you know, that then suddenly becomes he becomes Fabius Maximus uh, because he's so you know full of um, foresight. Whereas you know these consuls who die in battle and take you know eighty thousand Romans with them, they're somehow no longer what we needed at the time. But at the time, they were the definition of Romanitas. I, I was wondering how we're going to link to um, Alcibiades because it's such a good. When you talk about flip flopping. Uh, traitors, I think, or yeah, people perceive traitors. It's our number one example from ancient times, I guess. Well, Alcibiades is just another example of 
politics, you know, two political sides, and he's vying with the, you know, the more conservative element in Athens at the time, and coming off at, you know, a little bit worse for wear in terms of the publicising it as such, uh, how he's portrayed by some of them. And ultimately, I think he's, he's more driven towards being a, a traitor because of the political rivalry going on. I think there's a lot of personal ambition also in, in this mm. equation, usually. Uh, it's, it's, you don't always become a traitor simply because you want to be, because just for, for yeah, well, personal gain will be, a, of course, and ambition could be a part of that. And I think with, with Alcibiades, that, that plays a heavy part in there, trying to make a name for himself any which way he can. And when something fails, like the like Sicilian expedition, that he then decides, okay, this this is not working for me. Let's let's try something else, and that causes him to flip flop around a bit. Uh, Presumably, though, you don't want to be de- yeah. You don't want to be declared a, a traitor to your own people if you're trying to do a power grab or a power play. You you um, whereas no. in his case, it's the fact that he seemed to change allegiances very much to suit himself. At which point, surely that is very traitorous because he's. Tra- <laughs> He, it is completely personal gain. It's very difficult to sort of see that in any other way. Mm-hmm. Um, yet for some know. reason, he was forget he, uh, he went he was received back, and that that surely is the peculiarity of it. I think we give him too much credit in terms of saying, oh, he's he's flip flopping back and forth and whatnot. I think he's he's driven by his character more, and in some mm-hmm. cases, I mean, when he goes to Sparta, it's more his the way that he sort of throws himself into being a Spartan, that, you know, too much loyalty, too much bravado, and obviously a little bit too much with the king's wife, and, of course, he has he's forced into a change of allegiance. So I think that's his, his character. And again, in Athens, back there, he was the, you know, how can I say, the new blood who's coming through and leading the, the youthful generation. I think it's I think it's political expediency sort of taken to the to the nth degree, but he probably felt that there was no point that he couldn't get back even even at mm-hmm. you know before I guess Potomai, he um, you know makes one last try so it's almost like if I if I get on top I can explain everything I've done in a satisfactory demagogic manner uh, and people will be happy and that never happens and he you know as we say flip flops but the I mean the other thing that that occurs is um, other traitors who do that, um, we we don't see them as. I mean, Xenophon living in the Peloponnese with, uh, you know, that that we don't regard him as a traitor so much as as he probably was by Athenians at the time because he's such a, you know, we regard him as a pro-Spartan Athenian-based source. But from a from an ancient perspective, he probably was traitorish as well in the, in the fourth century. But it's probably the same as with Julius Caesar in that our, 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 the, the largest, our main source of information on Xenophon is again Xenophon himself. So I mean, if you, if you have this, if you're your, if you're your own publicist, uh, it, it works in your advantage. And I mean, Xenophon did a really good job. I mean, a lot of people dislike Xenophon and for some reason, uh, which is curious because he's the only author from antiquity that we have, as far as I know, whose entire corpus has survived. So maybe with him, it could also be similar as what would pro- probably be the case with Alcibiades, that there's a lot of personality in there as well, that he was himself also charismatic enough to get away with that sort of stuff uh, for the most part. But is it yeah. that we get yeah. a lot of information from one particular side? For example, you've got in Athens, you've got a lot of pro-Spartans running around, it seems, because we hear about the likes of Chimon, yeah. the likes of Alcibiades, who are representing Spartan interests at times, except we, it's not emphasised as much, and so maybe we, we're sort of thinking they are, you know, more so than they sh- we should be thinking, they are all on the side, they're all loyal to their cause, whereas maybe which it's more of a, you know, plethora of allegiances than we really 
give credit to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of the Athenian elite that, that we have sources of, of course, belong to a group that didn't embrace democracy. I mean, Plato has no no good word left for democracy, for example, which is what a lot of people forget. Uh, so it's yeah, it's part of the whole idea, the the idea that uh, the rule of the demos of the, the the people is not the most ideal rule for a city-state and then what the Spartans do of course because they are peculiar with their diarchy and with their efforts etc etc where they have like these guardians, these Plato-like guardians protecting the state for the for the benefit of all which is which also everybody being equal supposedly apart from of course the masses of slaves that they have and the subjugated perioikoi etc etc but th that's an ideal that very much appeals to Aristocrats who feel like this is our birthright. This is the sort of rule that we should have, and not all this, this rabble running around and going and voting for stuff. So it's it's something that appeals to the intelligentsia of of Athens, and those ha also happen to be our sources, of course, of information for the most part. And so they they almost become philosophical traders because they're they're not tied to the the rule of the best, um, and you know this sort of ideal. And I mean, similarly, when you look at um, when you look at the the all the, the many examples of tyranny, that essentially they are betraying their city to themselves. You know they and you know when you look at the Pisistratids, you know they are thinking they're the best thing for Athens, and therefore you know when he gets kicked when Pisistratus gets kicked out, he goes and makes this fabulous fake Athena, and then you know gets chased through the city, convinces them, hey, wow, it must be me, and then when they get thrown out again um, with Hippias and Hipparchus, I mean you know. Hippias bringing the the Persians to Marathon as a way of restoring his personal rule. Well, we did, did he uh, did he well, bring did the Persians he? or did the well, Persians bring Hippias? I think. Oh, <laughs> you know, and even and even the even the idea of of um, these great Athenians who then go and you know work for the enemy by going to into the Persian Empire and and you know finding uh, with Solon and. Uh, you know these others who go and get work with the Persians, with the enemy. Um, somehow, uh, then they are being traders, but they're not being traders because of the fickle nature of Athenian politics. Yeah, that's basically true for all of Greece. I mean, Persia is a is a force always there, either more in the background or more in the foreground throughout the fifth and fourth centuries. I mean, the, the Persian gold helped play out uh, Athens and Sparta against each other. The Persians were also they were very keen on keeping the Greeks in Greece. They weren't all that interested, I think, in actually conquering Greece, but that's a different discussion. Uh, but in, in making sure that the Greeks stay divided. So, you know, oh, the, the Athenians have the upper hand? Well, in that case, we give the Spartans some gold so they can get the upper Oh, the Spartans are getting too strong. We're going to give the Athenians some gold. Just let them fight amongst themselves. So it's it's... That also, it's, it's a complicated matter. It's not, not simply... I don't think working for Persia as such would have qualified you as a traitor or directly, but... Macedonians do it all the time. They're really... Oh, yeah. of, I mean, going back <laughs> to their dynasty, that every time the Persians turn up on their doorstep, they're pro-Persia this, pro-Persia that, and the Persians walk away yeah. again. And no, we're Greeks again. We're not... Nothing to do with those Persians. We'll leave an army against yeah. them someday. But then they are amazingly able to, you know, give themselves pro-Greek... Um, yeah. Attributes. You know, titles, which is which is like, how? How did you get that? Yeah. The Macedonians were masters in, in playing both sides, basically. As mm. soon as the Persians came, indeed, saying, oh, no, no, we're entirely pro-Persia. And then, of course, giving information about the Persian, Persian movements to the Greeks, and then saying, see, we're, we're with you all the way. And always trying to, to do a balancing act until finally Philip II decides to teach the Persians a lesson. If, if it's just the nature of Greek politics and to a to the same extent Roman politics, what is the moment that makes you declare someone a traitor as opposed to they're just being political? Why why, why take that absolute step to declare them a traitor? I would say it's very contextual and also very much person-based. I think it's it's very much in, in ancient times traitors are always very specific people in my experience. I can't really think of, of for example, you have cities that uh, when the Persians, for example, on their uh, campaign for that ends in, in Marathon, which was a very successful campaign, by the way, because they managed to get all the objectives done except smash Athens, which 
obviously wasn't that big of a deal. But for example, when they arrived on Euboia, they, they went to Karastos, which is on the very uh, eastern tip of the uh, the island. And there the uh, inhabitants decided, you know, we can do a long siege and then the Persians will get angry and angry and they'll smash us. It's better if we just do, just basically uh, surrender ourselves and then we get to live. So that's what they did. They surrendered to the Persians. Basically, they were being traitors. But you never really hear anything about that uh, in later history, that the, that the people from Karastos are labeled as traitors. Whereas, for example, Eretria did, of course, uh, resist the Persians because they knew that the Persians were angry for the support that they gave the Greeks uh, during the Ionian Revolt. And, of course, Eretria was destroyed, uh, all the inhabitants uh, murdered, and uh, that was basically it. So it's it's very much contextual, and it's very personal, I always feel. I can't really imagine, can't think of any city or something that that's get labeled as a city of traitors or, or whatever it's Athens is very good at labeling traitors I think though when it comes to the Delian League later on and they decide who's actually been a traitor as such to Greece and who's going to be punished at least in the earlier stages before they become very how can I say uh, just interested fickle. in the money side of yeah fickle, <laughs> that's what I'm after <laughs> Yeah. The ostracism was specifically invented to get rid of people that were supposedly uh, enemies of the Athenian state. So that was... But that, I don't think it is. I think ostracism is like a, uh, how can I say, like a, an overflow valve mm -hmm. in which they basically are you know, looking for anybody who overdoes their bit and give them a timeout card. Mm -hmm. and then get them out of the city for a bit, bring them back, but it's not necessarily seen as a punishment. With, with you know, the ostracer, ostraca that survive of, mm. you know, ostracizing Themistocles and Miltiades, mm. and from, from our perspective, these amazing contributors to Greek history at the time then suddenly get thrown out of their city as a, as we, and I think, you know, a lot of modern ancient historians regard that as punishment, you know, and that whole idea of a politician having a scheme of, of reform um, and then not being allowed to pursue it, and, and it may be that they didn't have such a thing that, that you know that they indeed wanted a timeout, and that I, that whole idea of Solon, you know, oh, well I'm I'm now going to wander off for ten years, see what you can do with it. So I think it's it's a very it's an interesting mechanism um, that that sort of enforced timeout, as you say. Yeah, I think the Roman version of that was to send someone out with the threat that they weren't allowed to be given fire, water, and salt or something. Mm -hmm. Can't think of what and it was. Cicero, in fact, Cicero, in fact, was subject Cicero to that. Had to wait it's to come back. Fire or fire or water within a certain distance of mm -hmm. normally Rome. But I think there was somebody. I can't remember who it was. Somebody was also given it, not just in terms of distance from Rome, but distance from Greece as well, because they knew his. They actually pinpointed all of his estates and then based the exclusion zone based on his properties around the Mediterranean and made sure that he couldn't go to any of them. If you were a patrician, rather than have you be executed, it mm. was a way for you to not so much save face but save your life. You'd have to leave all your wealth behind, but you managed to sort of get away and take your, take your life with you. Uh, but you were excluded, and the great humiliation, of course, was no longer to be a participant in the Roman Republic. With ostracism, you didn't get all your stuff repossessed, as far as I know. They didn't. They didn't lay claim. No, all they, stuff. They, protect, they protected it. Yeah. So it's I mean, something different from the uh, from the tyrants, for example, when they uh, when they seize power. You see, with with Kipsilos, if we believe that story in Herodotus, at least, when he gets rid of the uh, Bachiadai, um he confiscates all of their possessions and then redistributes it among his own. Uh, followers, thereby strengthening his own position, of course. Mm. So that's also, I mean, Kipps was basically was a, a traitor as far as the Bahirai were concerned, but um, he managed to get the upper hand and they become a, a sole ruler. Well, when Cicero gets it, uh, of course, when Clodius puts it into effect, uh, they, they take possession of his house, pull it down, rebuild Huff, it's used to build a new temple so he can't hopefully build the house again, and then half the property is added to his next-door neighbours so he can build a new patio. But they were trying to humiliate him. Yeah. I mean, he'd got this fabulous house by, I think it was partly uh, by not necessarily the best means, he was given a low-interest loan or something, and it was yeah. very ostentatious. Perhaps by crisis. Was it, 
he could sort of look over the Forum Romanum or something, yeah. and this was one way to get back at him. Uh, mm. And I think the humiliation, he felt it very personally, and he, not only because it was a slight on him as a man, but he was denied participation in the Res Publica, which is which is the most beloved thing. But also, the one thing that most of the sources, don't, and none of the history books really focus upon, is actually what happens to his family in the meantime. Nobody actually mentions what where they go. They just all of a sudden materialise when he actually gets back, and they meet him in Brindisium. But of course, if his house is being you know overrun and pulled down, his properties in the uh, in the country around Rome are being plundered of all of his collections of stuff that he's amassed over the years. Where they've gone, I mean, it is a, a punishment on the whole family. I would imagine his wife and the children would have gone to live with her father. I guess that would be the most logical thing to do. But, yeah, but, right. also, but also his son-in-law uh, ends up getting killed. Um, mm. I don't know if that's just before or just after his return. Mm. But something's, being, something's going on there that we're not really clued into, really. Um, yeah. Taking you know, revenge upon the whole family, really, and making sure that the suffering is widespread. Uh, and this idea of punishing the family is interesting. So, for example, in the case of Germanicus's alleged murder, and I have a view on that, um, Cnaeus Pope Calpurnius Piso, for example, has already sailed away on a boat, and he comes back to reclaim the title of, of governor where he supposedly resigned it. And he takes the army, I believe it's from Syria, and then tries to retake his, uh, his, his province. And, of course, in doing that, he commits this act of violation of maestas, which is effectively he, he becomes a traitor. Uh, so, of course, he's then tried in Rome, and, of course, uh, the, the evidence is brought forward, and, and of course, uh, uh, various evidence takes them in various directions, but the key point is he ultimately supposedly commits suicide, and the verdict of the Senate, which is hearing the, a kind of grand jury, if you like, um, declares that he, has, he is guilty of maestas, and the punishment is spread across the family. And one of the things that Tiberius does is to intervene and say, no, 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 we, you know, we're going to strike this name, name off the roll, so in other words, the man is down now to memoria, but no, the sons will be allowed to live on because we don't want to eliminate completely mm -hmm. the, the Calperni Pisones. What's interesting in the case of Marcus Antonius, for example, they're so concerned to damn him, nobody in his family is allowed to use the name Marcus, ever. So you can be an Antonius, but you will never be able to use the combination Marcus Antonius. It is forbidden by law. Um, so you can see that they, they go to great lengths to expunge people uh, from from the public record so that they almost never existed. The point is there is that you know, traitors are treated very, very seriously at different points in history. Uh, and the Romans are very legalistic about it. They, they have a provision in, I guess, the Greek states, depending on whether the democracies or uh, you know king, kingdoms and so on have their particular solutions as well. No more so than Augustus as well, because of course the most, I think, for him, above Mark Antony, I would say the, the most prominent traitor during his time is his daughter and his granddaughter when they go against his proclamations of the, the new uh, moral code that he installs and they get this public punishment of being banished. I mean, mm -hmm. it's labelling someone within your own family a traitor is not out of the question, even for the emperor. Mm -hmm. the, the, the thing with traitors under the empire, of course, is that we, we have this wonderful different perspective, you know, traitors under Nero, uh, you know, the generals who are doing far too successfully like Corbulo and others, it's like, well, he's not a traitor, he was he was being judged a traitor by a tyrant, therefore he wasn't clearly, and in fact, you know, some subsequent history tells us that because they try and um, sort of uh, reintroduce the idea of Corbulo, especially with Domitia um, uh, under Domitian, uh, which, you know, again, under Domitian, it's like if you're a traitor under Domitian and your career gets sort of stopped, are you? Um, but even even in, in characters like Sertorius in Spain, who's a traitor and you know is difficult, he he becomes in later history a a sort of a, a paragon of Roman uh, virtue and military skill because he's so difficult to deal with. But so this this sort of twisting and changing. Even though he's a he's a traitor, he still maintains Roman rule though. So he's sort of a traitor more in terms of the political scene at the time, rather than necessarily a traitor to Romanitus as such. Everyone, everyone's doing it, so I'm doing it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in Is there a parallel with uh, Carusius and Alectus, these sort of the breakaway British uh, empire, if you like? Uh, you, you could argue from the, from the central Roman 
polity that they were clearly traitors, and that's why they sent was it Constantius Chlorus off to deal with it. Um, so you know these things are, are always bubbling under the surface, and, and I guess the interesting thing is how well the system that Augustus put in place um, was able to control elements of this. And it came down. What I think one of the questions that we got asked uh, on, on Facebook or so was um, you know, how, how emperors kind of managed the situation. I think Augustus was very good at managing human relations. He picked his men very well. Um, and of course, depending on whether his successes were as good as him in that regard, those people could either be later become threats or not. And as the empire matures and goes into the 200s and 300s, it becomes much more of a problem. I think I think the the, the way that the Roman imp, empire and emperors dealt with it was winning and surviving. Um, you know, when you look at the year of the nine emperors, uh, nine emperors. Gosh, um, if you, you look at the year of the four emperors in 69, um, you. You've got this, you know. If if Vespasian had lost, he would have been a traitor because he declared, you know, his legions declared him emperor. He marches on Rome, da da da. But because he's victorious, um, it, it, he again gets to rewrite history. He's better than what he replaced. He introduces a, a, a dynasty which, until Domitian, is better than the one it replaced. So um, all of that sort of uh, again hindsight and the winners writing history is is essential to whether you're a traitor or a, a, a great Roman emperor. You, know. you, you raise a very interesting point. So, for example, if, if you are in, in AD 68, 69, the year of the four emperors, um, and, and different of the Roman legions stationed in Britain, just in case there are four at the time, uh, and one declares for one candidate, another declares for another candidate, uh, and one of them is left victorious, and the other one is now embarrassed because it's sworn to the wrong guy. Um, are they, the legions, then determined or regarded as traitors? Is there a, a rehabilitation that has to take place? Because they had broken their sacramentum, their, their, their sacred oath uh, to, in effect, you know, defend the state, etc., etc. But they had actually sided with the other candidate, Vitellius or Galba, whoever it might have been. Is there any evidence that, that there was a there were consequences? Or were units broken up? Were you know, commanders uh, asked to fall on their swords? I think I think there's a there's a a tour of unity that it happens certainly in the um, in the civilists uh, in seventy. There's a sort of a, a let's go to the front, let's defeat this traitor, and then the legions will declare their loyalty to Vespasian uh, via um, the commander of probably the, the the legion led by Domitian, so that you know that uh, they can make amends, if you like, by by correcting their mistake. And whether you think they're sincere or not, you can replace personnel or um, things like that. And I mean, the uh, two Audiatrix is made up of, of members of the Ravenna fleet who declare for Vespasian. So there's this sort of, um, so, yeah, I think there is signs of loyalty and signs of, of making amends if you happen to declare for the wrong side. And I think the all of the, the victors must have realized that they needed to give people who may have made the wrong choice, that choice, I think, that they had to be offered the option of, of declaring for you the right winner, shall we say. Yeah. Because ultimately each legatus legionis is, is, a, is appointed anyway by the emperor. So at some point the victor, in this case Vespasian, can clean house and replace them all with his own men. Of course that's at the risk of replacing very good generals in the field who've obviously got the loyalty of their men maybe after a couple of years. Uh, but it's very interesting. I mean, when you get these regime changes, uh, it takes a while for the news to travel around, and of course not everybody agrees with it. Uh, classic case, of course, is when Tiberius takes over from Augustus, and the Rhine legions actually sort of say, well, Germanicus is our guy, um, you know, why, why did you become Caesar? And of course his response is, absolutely not, my father is the one I'm loyal to, I, in this case Tiberius. And then later when you've got the, the four Caesars as a, as a, a way of ensuring... Uh, Sort of continuity when you've got the two emperors and the two Caesars, and the idea is that you know that, that, that we hand over, and it's a beautiful system. And then under Constantine, it all goes pear-shaped, and, and everyone rebels, and you know it's just incessant civil war. Um, and traitors, traitors abound. And then Constantine is victorious, and he is clearly not a traitor. He's clearly um, he's he's fabulous um, because he is who he is. So um, that that whole idea of hindsight uh, and who who writes the history uh, again just comes to the fore throughout the whole span of ancient history. 
so again, the, to Yosha's point earlier on, right, who writes the history, uh, <laughs> clearly it has a, has a lot to uh, say in terms of what we get to find out about as the uh, receivers of that history. So if a threat is on the winning side, does that mean that the winner ultimately lost through the long lens of history? Most of them are not the, the great men of history, I think. I mean, all the ones that we've talked about so far. Uh, I mean, Memnon of Rhodes, for example, was considered a traitor. Uh, who, the only man who might have been able to stop Alexander the Great if the, the Persians had completely trusted him, according to the Greek sources. Of course, this is a, a thing that goes back. You already see that in Herodotus, where Greeks who are on the Persian side give sound advice to the Persians and then the Persians ignore them uh, much to their chagrin later. Um, and the same happens with Memnon of Rhodes, of course. He is uh, a member of the, on, on the Persian side. Uh, he rules part of uh, Asia Minor along with his brother initially. Um, and he is a respected military commander, but somehow the Persians don't completely trust him because he's originally Greek. So he gives sound advice on how to stop Alexander, and they don't listen to him. And then, of course, he is proven correctly, according to the to the Greek uh, version of the story, as always. But he's an example, I think, of what could be labeled a traitor uh, as such, because he sided with the Persians, who is on the losing side, uh, and who nevertheless did manage to have a whole string of victories before he succumbed to a disease, which was a bit... Uh, mm -hmm would have been interesting to see if he had lived what he could have been able to do. Well, and I'm going to throw the ring here, which is the, the famous Arminius. Um, and he, he's the classic traitor, isn't he? He's, he's the man who uh, even the Emperor Augustus sort of welcomes in as part of the grand family and gives him the, uh, the, the equestrian status and his own unit, and he goes off and manages to uh, pull the wool over uh, Varus's eyes. And ultimately, he is actually murdered by his own people. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so he gets... gets Betrayed twice, effectively. He betrays, and he is himself betrayed. Now, there's also an interesting case with uh, Fanny of Halicarnassus, which is the, his story, or the the logos that uh, Herodotus tells, at least. Uh, I took his inspiration to um, to have Johnny draw draw the uh, the cover illustration. Uh, this is a guy who had a high position uh, in Egypt as a Greek mercenary. So already you have a Greek working for a, a foreign. Uh, kingdom basically, who got to be uh, a confidant of uh, Amasis II, according to Herodotus, but who at one point has to flee for some reason. He's fallen out of favor, or there's some sort of problem. He, he flees, he is pursued by the pharaoh's uh, men, he's eventually captured, he manages to elude his captors in Anatolia, and then crosses over to the Persian side. Uh, and he serves as an advisor to the Persians. And then he is with the army of the Persians as they arrive uh, on the borders of Egypt, preparing to subdue Egypt. And what turns out, which is a little odd, is that he left Egypt while leaving his family behind. And then as the Persians prepare for the assault, his former uh, Greek buddies, uh, the men that were under his command, where, where he was the, the mercenary leader of, they take out his children and they butcher them in front of uh, Phanes basically. Phanes is at the Persian site and he just watches them kill his children and let the blood flow into a bowl which they mix and then they uh, each take a sip of the, of the mixing bowl uh, so they drink the blood as a very public condemnation of his treason of course and what happens with the man later we don't know loads of people die at Pelusium in 525 BC so we assume that he was also killed somewhere but that's a, a case where really a traitor was uh, punished very uh, publicly, uh, despite the fact that he was, of course, according to history, on the winning side of the equation because the Persians clearly won at Pelusium and they then managed to lay siege to Memphis, etc., etc., and the Egypt was basically broken after that. That particular one actually makes me think of uh, Coriolanus in terms of the Romans. Mm and his family being brought out uh, opposite the, the army to actually plead for his uh, coming back to the Roman side as such. So, again, parallels there. Yeah, you sort of have to wonder what goes, what the expectation is precisely on the part of these men. Do they consider themselves traitors? I mean, when Phanes ra ran away from Egypt, he... He did so because he did, apparently faithful or did something or whatever. But apparently it didn't occur to him that his family might be in jeopardy if he were ever to return, even when he came back 
with the Persian army. You would imagine that he would have tried to get his family out before then, but apparently it didn't work like that, or he didn't expect that. I, I don't know. It's it's a very curious case. But you know, I, I wonder on a more generic sort of level. Um, you know, uh, re-expanding the history. And I was watching something recently about the Cold War and about how the um, Soviets had managed to get spies into very high places in Britain. And, uh, you know, you're asking, the, do these people think of themselves as traitors? I don't think Kim Philby um, or uh, Anthony Blood thought they were tra traitors, that they passionately believed in their particular position. And uh, they, they saw democracy as being a sort of uh, a shadow show for the benefit of the rich people. You know, let's, let's have the, the demos you were talking about this earlier. Uh, let us fool them into thinking they have a say in this, but really we pull all the strings. Um, and you know, I, I would imagine there's a direct parallel with the ancient world. I mean, these people do what they do out of either a passionate belief or you know money, um, like the famous uh, Thermopylae thing. Someone's doing it for a bag of money to you know show the uh, Persians the, the path uh, so they can go around the back. But uh, I think most people do this out of a, a, a strong personal conviction. Yeah, so the, yeah. the story about Thermopylae, by the way, the, you have to question whether Herodotus is inventing stuff in that particular case, because it seems very unlikely that the Persian king of kings would have been unable to scout out the terrain and find this way around a small Greek army. So this is probably a case where the Greeks thought, we will not have these Persians uh, beat us through uh, anything else than, than trickery to expose their inherent weakness. So I, I don't know, but... Yeah, there are, of course, cases where that, where that does happen. <laughs> it's, I mean, the, 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 case, the case of Thermopylae is interesting because um, it's one of only two or three unfulfilled promises in, in uh, Herodotus where he tells us what the fate will be of the traitor and then he doesn't. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting. The other, I mean, the other, the other thing with Thermopylae, of course, is, and this is where my brain has faded, um, who was the Spartan king with Xerxes? Uh, um, Demaratus. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, Demaratus is is restoring his his personal kingship. Um, so it, you know, to himself and to his royal lineage, he's not a traitor to us and to hindsight and to history and to the authors of of Greek history. He is a traitor. Um, you know, the similar story of Themistocles before the Battle of Salamis, um, who can actually use that example when he goes to Persia. And so, well, no, no, I was giving you the, you know, absolutely political expediency from a from an Athenian politician. You know, was he betraying the Athenians? No, because they won. Then he can go to um, Persia and say, I was, I was being true. So again, he's playing both sides. He's flipping and flopping, or well, not, but you know, he can interpret it that way, depending on who holds political sway when he needs them to. And Demaratus is again an example of one of those, uh, of the Greek motif, which is very common in Herodotus and in later Greek writers also, of uh, a Greek advisor to the Persians who is continuously ignored by uh, the king of kings and his, uh, and his Persian uh, allies. Because Demaratus actually gives tips on, you know, Spartans, you have to fight them, fight them this way and that way, and he, he continuously gets ignored. And then, of course, the Persians pay for that. Is, is there a class again, divide as well, where, uh, where where big people do it for the best of their of their uh, country, for how they see, you know, for, for nationalistic reasons? Yet the little man does it for cash. You know, he gets a bag of gold and he's deemed a traitor. Yet the the, the traitor who's an important person doesn't do it for money. They they are the best of principles behind it all. That's the villain. Everybody loves the villain because you know the the thing can turn on base base sort of motives. Uh, but I think the aristocrats are as base as anybody else. I mean, they just play for bigger money and bigger stakes. I mean, you know, I mean, the thing is that you know the patron saint of the traitor, Judas, in, in that sense, um, is part of a divine plan. So there must be a traitor who does what Judas does, you know, in the in the the story of the of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But the 30, 30 pieces of silver is absolutely what you're saying. Uh, that that it's that it's the it's the petty crime, and therefore it's it's got no high high ideal attached to it. Um, and I'm coming back to your idea about the, you know, people on the losing side, Artemisia of Halicarnassus, um, who changes sides uh, midway through um, the, the the Battle of Salamis, for instance, and, you know, charges, um, you know, it's that's quite amazing and very uh, selfish in the sense that she's, she's um, portrayed as giving the right advice 
um, again, because Herodotus is a Halicarnassan, but also because of this sort of sense that she betrays, and it's not interpreted as betrayal. It's interpreted as uh, as brilliant. You know, all my all my women, are, all my men are women, and my 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 woman is a man, kind of thing. But I think that's political expediency when they actually get back to Persia later on. That uh, he's sort of saving face with a, an ally that he needs at that time to uh, deal with possible rebellions that he might be facing. He, she's got enough of a fleet that he needs, so he, he can't really label her a traitor, even though it's blatant for all to see. <laughs> Absolutely. But you said that she actually received money for it, so in that regard she's a mercenary, isn't she? No, I, th I think, I, from what I remember, I think it's her family do some sort of deal with the Persians, don't they, that they are allowed a certain amount of autonomy in their region in return for the their alliance to the Persians and serving in the fleet. But then, I'm a little rusty on this one. Yeah, that does fit with Persian politics because the Persians yeah. tended to, to leave, especially the, the outlying regions, and, and mm -hmm. Anatolia was basically an outlying region of the Persian Empire, uh, a sufficient degree of, of, of autonomy. It's, it's basically the system that Alexander inherited later that he also mm. kept in place, local leaders, local, they know the local situation best, so let's just yeah. leave them to muddle in the local affairs as long as they pay taxes and they don't rise up against us. So that's, that fits the whole Persian scheme, I'd say. Actually, that's one area of, you know, that's full of traitors, I think, that we've sort of missed here, that uh, when you get after Alexander into the early period of the successes, I mean, they are labelling each other traitors all over the place, and they yeah. are engaging in all sorts of uh, either outward, you know, action against each other, each other, or you know, plotting against each other in private. Where, whether it's in terms of royal marriages, whether it's in terms of, uh, you know, grabbing a little bit of land here through a, you know, a scheme here and there, uh, it's. The, the terms traitors and where their alliances stand, whether they're being loyal to their idea of reuniting the Macedonian kingdom at some stage or whether they are going out as independent regents, then uh, you know, that sort of idea is thrown around willy-nilly. Yeah, making sure that Alexander's widow and his son uh, disappear uh, off the stage, mm. also not the most patriotic thing to do, I guess. So it uh, another question from uh, Facebook. Um, how were deserters handled when Philip the Macedon was in charge? Uh, and were there any differences when Alexander took control after his father's death? Do we have Do we have any evidence of deserters? Philip the Second, I don't know, but Alexander's army, of course, there were uh, rabble rousers, let's say, and then he did uh, have the uh, ringleaders executed. I don't remember if they were crucified or something else, but they were. You've also and got the Parmenian. Parmenian is uh, close yeah. to a traitor, really. Yeah. I mean, he's sort of working in behind the scenes, both in Philip's time and then in Alexander's time, nearly leading a sort of a rival dynasty, perhaps, that almost sort of comes to the front, and then all of a sudden, with the, the murder of his son and then his own murder later on, uh, that dynasty is sort of swept aside and... You know, the, Whereas they've sort of been only just towing the line with Alexander, and Alexander sort of allows Parmenian's family to retain certain positions of authority. There, it's more for his benefit that they are useful rather than that they're loyal. He knows they're a danger, I think, to him. But mm -hmm. uh, for a certain amount of time, especially in his early career, he tolerates it because they are the old guard and they've got a lot of men loyal to them more so than necessarily maybe to his, you know, the younger generation coming through along with Alexander. Yeah, Philip II, I don't think we have any sources about how he dealt with traitors specifically. I don't think there's, yeah. th nothing springs to mind at least as far as how he might have. He would probably have dealt with it same way as they did in ancient times, banishment, execution, <laughs> or uh, a nasty, not been a lot of surprises. A nasty yet. death. <laughs> yeah, or, or just banishment. Depends also, again, on the status of somebody. I mean, somebody who's low rank and he decides to run away from the army, you hunt him down and you kill him if you want to. And somebody who's very high status, of course, you, you would be slightly more circumspect. Well, well like Alexander, said, Mark, depending on the, on the situation. Alexander himself is a traitor, though. 
for after <gasps> the, the marriage. I mean, you've got Alexander and all of his mates banished from the kingdom by Philip. So I think that, I mean, that's probably the only thing that we can probably draw upon in terms of how Philip would deal with it. But it's yeah. an extreme example. But well, you've got you've also got the um, uh, cultural betrayal, I suppose, in that regard of being un-Greek um, when when you know there's this uh, adoption of Persian. Uh, Customs and trouser wearing. Gosh, wearing trousers—it's just—it's just not done. That that you know, Greece rebels, and and even Macedonians sort of you know are perplexed by this idea that that you can be pro-Persian and yet Greek, and the whole idea you know the the Tan Brotherhood of Man and all that sort of thing. Um, but from a Greek perspective, that's 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 absolute cultural betrayal. Uh, similarly with Josephus, you know, Josephus. Uh, being the last surviving member of a of a suicide pact, who doesn't? <laughs> um, so is, well, and then you know, and then and then becomes a Roman uh, apologizer. Um, it's a very you know, but he is Josephus. He is the source for so much that we only have him for. Um, and yet, from a, there's a, there's a sort of a disquiet. It's like um, I don't know that I can trust you because of what you tell us you've done. The article by Barry Webb in the in the issue is uh, is interesting because he compares Jeremiah and, and Josephus and uh, whereas the former managed to talk his way out of being regarded a traitor, Josephus unfortunately uh, didn't, at least not on the part of his own people. Yeah, so so ideally you, uh, you need to write your own history to uh to see whether you're going to be uh, declared a traitor in the long term. You, you need to be an aristocrat, and you need to be uh, you need to, to to write your own uh, memoirs. Let's yeah. Say. So so <laughs> so when survive, write history and ensure that that history survives down to modern times. Four yeah. four rules to not be regarded as a traitor. Yeah. And with that, I think we'll call it a day. And uh, I'd like to thank Joshua Murray. Lindsay and Mark. <laughs>